So I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you're joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. And um, we're very fortunate to have with us today, Michelle Iverson. Um, Michelle Cooper Iverson is the Chief Operating Officer of the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC, Group of Social Purpose Entities. This includes Coho Management Services Society and the Community Land Trust. She holds a designation in Human Resources and is a graduate of the Master of Management Cooperatives and Credit Union Program at St. Mary's University. Michelle is responsible for executing operational plans that impact Cooperative Housing Federation, BC, COHO, and the Community Land Trust with a goal of ensuring that CHF BC's wholly owned subsidiaries are working in cooperation with a focus on strengthening the organization and the co-op housing sector. So I'll, I'll pass things over to Michelle. And, Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to start sharing my, my screen. I won't talk any more about myself because that was quite the introduction. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so how are we doing for, uh, can you see my screen okay? Okay, awesome. Um, so thanks for having me. I hope that um, when, this, when I put these slides together and in our talk today, that um, I'm gonna leave enough time for us to maybe have some discussion, ask some questions. Um, and I do wanna talk a little bit about CHFPC, about the whole housing co-op sector generally, and into what um, I have been using as a sort of first generation, second generation term. That, that really just means that, you know, a lot of housing co-ops were built, the majority of them were built um, 1973 to 2000, as far as 2002. And then there was kind of a, um, a call a desert of, of zero growth. And then it started picking up again in 2014 and, um, and continues to today. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the factors that are influencing that growth um, and um, also how we are as a sector uh, working collaboratively and cooperatively to ensure that housing co-ops continue to be, to be one of the solutions for our affordable housing crisis that, that we're facing right now. So um, these are a little bit about my introduction. So first generation, second generation. And the fourth part I, I sort of categorize as some new initiatives that are coming on. There's some, there's, some, there's some new federal money coming on. There's a new $500 million um, renters protection fund. What does CHFBC play? What role we play in that? And what that might look like? Um, it's very, very early stages, but I do uh, realize that this group is very interested in developing that model, and I wanted to make sure that you, uh, you, I was able to touch on that and see what resources you might be able to access or 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 lean into uh, in the future. So ultimately, at CHFPC, our vision really is that that co-op housing is is continues to grow, and that means retaining um, the older co-op homes and building new, and also that the affordability is permanent and. Um, and that when one thinks of co-op housing is that there is a security of tenure, that this is your forever home if that's what you want. And, and that really is why we exist today. And we create a platform to represent all of our co-op members um, and, and we provide them a number of services. So we have education and you know, direct support to people that live in housing co-ops and their boards. We assist them in um, maintaining um, their buildings and also planning for capital repairs and maintenance in the future. We um, are not dependent on government, um, at, at, at any kind of government. So we do use a combined group buying power of what all co-ops need in that sort of retail space. And uh, we so, so that we're able to provide significant savings and products for our housing co-ops. And also that feeds into our revenue um, as, a, as, a, as a membership association as well. In fact, our, um, our membership dues only represents 40% uh, of our revenue um, and the rest of it is coming from, from different sources. So that really keeps membership dues affordable for, for housing co-ops. We also have two business units that are used to advance the strategic 
vision and mission of siege of co-ops one which is a property management company of 40 percent of housing co-ops actually use this service and um and the other is our own social purpose real estate development which is uh known as the community land trust you might have heard about it um uh, the community land trust has was first incorporated in 1993 but really sort of took up speed as as the as the as the vehicle for growth for housing co-ops since 2015. Our board, uh, we're, we're not for profit, we're cooperative um, um, under the Cooperative Association Act. And our board of directors uh, are people that actually live in housing co-ops themselves. And um, we have a senior management team, uh, which is led by our CEO, Tom Armstrong. And each um, senior manager is responsible for a di di um, different business unit. So the um, property management is, is managed by um, our executive director, Helena Kuresh. Our social purpose real estate development is um, the Community Land Trust, Tiffany Dezita, and myself, I'm responsible for op operational oversight for CHFPC. That said, um, I really want to say that if you want to get into the weeds about real estate development, um, Tiffany Dezita is that person. But um, I'm, as part of the management team, I can speak to the general growth and we'll be able to answer, I think, most of your questions. But don't be surprised if I say that's a question for our real estate department and I can get back to you on that. Uh, co-ops, uh, this is some samples of co-ops uh, all across British Columbia. It really is about any sort of human service and that you can choose to incorporate cooperatively. It is not limited to housing and it has been used very effectively by marginalized communities um, to, to support themselves and create their own working conditions. Regardless of whether it's housing or car sharing, co-ops all have these, these cooperative principles and, um, and, and it's, it is supported on by an international, it's, it's supported internationally. So let's zoom into housing here. And this is what we often call the housing continuum, where you're going from one end of homelessness and the other end of, of home ownership. Housing cooperatives sits in this unique space between receiving, between non-market housing, there is uh, some sort of subsidy for, uh, for the rental payments, but there is ownership. Um, as long as you follow the rules of the housing co-op, as long as you, you pay your housing charges, you can live there. And for, for many people, this is their forever home. What's really unique about housing cooperatives is that you can transition through different stages of your life without leaving your housing co-op. So we have many people that will come as a young family and then go back to school or, um, or now there's two incomes or the children have moved out of the home and they, they have an internal move to another unit, all without leaving your, your housing co-op. So it is something that is, is unique and certainly something that our members say that they, they treasure as part of their housing co-op community. I know that you're interested in developing housing co-ops of your, of your own. So I wanted to share this, this paper, uh, just taking a couple snapshots, because I want to identify that, you know, um, there are different models around the world as to how housing is developed um, in, in that affordable space. And if you look at the graphic to the right, you can see um, that where it says number one, that's what happens is you create a housing society. They're the initiator, they're financing it, they're owning it. They're getting some support from government. Um, and then, then they find the residents and the residents will pay housing charges or rent to the housing society. This is very much the model that's built, that's, that's happening in BC, where we're creating a housing society and then finding the residents. But I want to point out that that's not the only model. This is a sample of a model in, in Vienna, where it actually starts with the future residents. The future residents come together, then they create a housing society that finances and owns it, and then they get allocation and support from government. If you're interested in this paper, I'm happy to share it with you, but um, this, is a, this is one model. I'm sorry I can't pronounce it, <laughs> um, but this is a model in, in Vienna. I can, I can upload it to the chat if you're interested. And yet another model that exists where you have a group of people that initiate finance and own the building, um, they create the housing, 
and um, and then they have another group of people that are contributing and living there um, and paying rent to the original group. So that's another sort of collaborative um, um, home ownership or, or 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 model. I think you we use the word co-housing, we use the word collaborative housing, we use the word cooperative housing. There are all these little different subtleties, but ultimately um, it is just about a group of people coming together and and providing housing for either that group of people or another group of people uh, with some support from government um, so that um, to add to the level of affordability. So in uh, British Columbia, we have um, not-for-profit housing. We also have uh, co-op housing. We also have equity co-op housing. I'm not going to talk about equity co-op housing today, but I will say that both a not-for-profit and an equity co-op are incorporated under the legal statute of the Cooperative Association Act. But um, there's also apartment corporations. They operate very, very similar to a cooperative. They're incorporated under the Business Corporations Act. You will see many of them in the West End. Uh, they have leases with the city of Vancouver. And even though they are not um, formally a cooperative, when you look at how they operate, they're very much a cooperative, cooperative or collaborative housing. So in a typical housing co-op, you have the housing co-op members, which are the residents. They appoint a board of directors um, and they, they, um, they work and get, um, they work with the federations, either CHF Canada, which is a national federation or the provincial federation, which is CHFBC. They're reporting at some level to government. They're accountable for their finances through the auditor. And they typically hire and supervise a group of a management team to, to, um, to manage their buildings. These are some samples of what housing co-ops look like in British Columbia. Uh, they range from this um, sort of three-story single homes within a within a site to um, you know to two buildings like like the Manhattan that's downtown here, which is a historic built building as well. This building is in um, is Haney Pioneer in, in Maple Ridge, and and you could see that it. Um, they are they're separate units and they're spread out. They're, there's no density, but they're spread out over a large, a large lot of land. And then um, this, this co-op is in False Creek and you can see um, multiple units, a lot more dense. And we'll talk more about density and how that impacts um, the new generation because of the, um, the, the cost for operations is a lot more efficient when you have more units. Definitely all focused on different, whatever family looks like for whomever lives there. And, um, and, and a place that, uh, that is unique um, for, for the residents. But I will say that, that this, is a, this is a unique one in that this is called the Greater Vancouver Floating Homes. That is also a housing co-op and they are a member. I think you all recognize Falls Creek North there, uh, but um, this, this is also a member of CHFPC. So housing co-ops, you know, cluster in the lower mainland, cluster in Vancouver Island, and sort of spread out into the into the interior. Those are the stats there that you're you're seeing on your screen. But the advantage being is that they're operating at cost. And I'm going to come back to these sort of three building blocks of what makes housing affordable. And it it comes down to, you know, what is the amount of debt? How much are you putting in reserves and how much does it cost to operate the building? Um, and and that's that's that is what the the sort of at cost is. You've got to put away reserves. How much are you gonna? Um, what is the cost to operate? And how much debt do you have? So the logical thing is that as you pay off the mortgage and as the debt decreases, uh, depending on you're paying off the mortgage or you're taking out a second mortgage to repair the buildings, the housing costs will naturally come down just as the as the as the debt comes down. Operational costs, they're always going to be, you know, pretty, pretty standard to operate the building, and they're always going to be putting some money into reserves. But when you're looking at building um, new housing or creating new co-op communities, you're going to have to look at which one of these three building blocks are you going to work with so that you can, um, you can create that level of affordability that you want. 
So let's look at the debt, the debt being the big one. If you get grants, forgivable grants, if you get amortization periods of not 30 years, but 50, if your interest rates are lower, that is going to have a serious impact on the level of affordability that you can have in your particular housing co-op. And um, when it comes to security of tenure, again, I did talk about that. It's just really about you follow the rules, you pay your housing charges, you're a good neighbor, then, then you, there, you're not looking at any sort of landlord rent evictions or, um, because it can be that, that, that security for, for many families. And we often underestimate or don't amplify that community involvement. We have so many co-op members that um, that are, you know, have 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 decided to be full-time parents, but they're on their co-op board. And your co-op is a business, and um, it provides you this opportunity to continue your learning, to continue your education, to be continuing your work skills by participating in your co-op, whether it's as as your board a board of directors or on a committee, but you're still making that life decision to um, to to be a, a full time parent at home with children. So this, that's just one example of the opportunities that that volunteerism um, and I don't know if that's a word, but uh, provides in in the co-op in the co-op lifestyle. We always aim for um, permanently affordable. I talked a little bit about that and um, one of the strengths that I think is also um, not amplified enough is that housing co-op members are mixed income. Uh, lots of time I ask people, what do you know about housing co-ops? They go, oh, it's low income. Well, it's a very small percentage, often sometimes 30% that are that are paying that, um, that shelter rate. Is the highest rent um, market, it's usually a little bit less than market. So let's say maybe 90%. 80% depends on the co-op depends on how much debt they have um, so it would be a little bit less than market but at the same time they're not everybody living in a housing co-op is is paying that shelter rate uh, shelter being the term that we use for the the sort of core need so for a, a one bedroom that's like three hundred and seventy five dollars six hundred and sixty dollars a month for for two bedroom and so forth um, um, our housing co-op members are are playing are paying varied amounts based on their income. But we always try to, um, as much as possible, and not 100% of co-ops can achieve this, but that people that are living there are not paying more than 30% of their household income, that being the cap. The housing co-ops are, you could see that large uh, chunk of purple there. This really shows the, the amount of housing co-ops based on the unit size. And this really comes to scale. And that second building block I talk about um, when it comes to affordability is operational costs. Um, operational costs for a smaller unit building, 30, 35, 40, um, you know, um, are, are not much different than, you know, 60, 80, 90. But the cost, but when you divide that cost by 60 homes versus 30 homes, the cost for that individual co-op is going to be, per unit, is going to be a lot higher. So you'll see in the new generation of housing co-ops where, um, there are a lot more dense, there are a lot number of units, um, and these housing co-ops that are the, the smaller size are, are something mostly of, of the first generation. Also interesting enough is that in British Columbia, the housing co-ops average size are, this, are these 56, 57 units. If you look in other parts of Canada, like in Toronto, um, they are closer to 200. And um, I haven't seen this personally, but I've heard that in Europe, they can be like 700 to 1,000 units. So the, the scale of the number of units per housing co-op is really important, is really important factor to consider when, you, when you're looking at, at, at building homes or developing communities. So it is a legal association. Um, these are some of the logistics here, one member, one vote. Um, you collectively own the co-op, but you don't have any equity in the land or the buildings. The goal isn't about creating equity or building equity or building individual private wealth, This is as we sometimes use that. Um, the goal is security of tenure, is being able to have a safe, secure home for as long as you want to live there. And um, the members that live there are the ones that are working together to create a viable business. But it doesn't mean that they're doing every single management piece of the building. They're hiring 
um, and supervising staff or trades to do that work for them. Um, I will move past this a little bit, but the only thing I want to talk about in this slide is that um, we don't use the term rent, we use the term housing charges. We don't use the term tenants, we use the term members. And also that the, um, the co-ops are not covered by the Residential Tenancy Act, they're covered by the Cooperative Association Act. And I talked a little bit about that cap of the 30% of their income going towards housing. Um, I don't know where that 30% amount came. I'm sure it predates me by quite a few years, but that's kind of the, the target that we that we work for that's set by government. So government really were the provincial and federal government were historically the developers of housing co-op. That, that arrangement no longer exists. Um, and there are programs that were in place to support housing co-ops. Uh, but recently that growth is now being led by the community housing sector. So not-for-profit housing co-ops, some of them actually do own their land. So we call them freehold. But you could see that there's 89, um, 89 housing co-ops uh, of the 260 that are, are leasing their land. And the city of Vancouver being the largest uh, leasehold um, of the city of Vancouver there with 53 of those of those 89. But what's important to recognize is that um, these private companies and private individuals um, and pension funds, they have leases that will expire. And at some point, they have a responsibility to their own entity. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that has come to play out for some housing co-ops in, in the last year or two. So once you have government support, there comes with it government rules. Government support can look different in terms of a forgivable loan, a startup grant, uh, mortgage insurance, um, operational financial assistance. Um, some municipalities have offered land, like the city of Vancouver, for example, in, in a couple of our co-ops, we will sign a lease for $10. So the cost of the land is um, over to the community land trust and um, the land trust takes on the additional um, um, responsibilities of receiving financing, construction costs, operational costs, but, um, but the land is heavily discounted and that's what contributes to making that, that debt line um, affordable. This is not always the case though. So with government comes rules and there are rules about the income maximum, who can live in the co-op, um, the what's called over housing and under housing standards. I, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, um, but um, I see you're shaking your head. Just basically that there is a certain number of people that can live in a certain number of units. Um, I could spend another half an hour talking about um, the occupancy standards, um, but I would say that given today's society and the fact that many people are living with grandparents and, um, and multiple generational families, the national occupancy standards can be um, not as inclusive as we aim to be um, and, and can have been, has been known to seriously impact women, for example, women leaving violence and um, unable to, to afford more than a one bedroom because they will you know, have their male and their female, their daughter and their son um, share a bedroom and occupancy standards can, can limit those kinds of things. And, um, and um, there's been great policy written on that. Do let me know if you're interested. Um, so, um, so post 2082, this is where it gets interesting. You know, these, these government operating programs are, are no longer available and, and what, what's, what's going to happen. So, here we see this big blue chunk of, of co-op housing being built. And you look past 2002, there's a little blip in 2004, nothing a blip in 2011. Well, that is that is 2011, that's the Athletes Village, um, First Avenue Athletes Village Housing Co-op, which came right after the Winter Olympics in Vancouver with the, um, the, the mayor's task force. Um, and, and that work started and that's when we started to see an uptick in, in policy related to, to housing. So since then, you can see the growth of housing co-ops that are that that have happened as uh, post 2011. And but there are challenges to growth. First of all, there are critics of the co-op governance model, and those critics um, 
there, um, they, the, when I say the governance model, I said there's a board of directors that make decisions for housing co-ops. So critics of the governance model can be a challenge to building and, and acquiring new buildings and making them into cooperatives. How the government provides support for housing has, is just different. The, the methodologies are different. And um, the days of the long operating agreements that, that left financial responsibilities for future generations um, are, are, are no longer. So, so things are different that way. It's difficult to get capacity for development and also the cost of land and construction costs um, are, 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 are a challenge. And the getting access to capital um, is, is also a challenge. And that's why um, the Community Land Trust, um, which, which, which was an, an, a nonprofit society that was wholly owned by the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC, really um, was the vehicle by which um, you're seeing this uptick in the growth of co-op housing um, in British Columbia. And as a community land trust, um, it's a nonprofit. It acquires the land. It holds the land uh, for the benefit of the broader community. This means that once the land is owned by the community land trust, it cannot be legally transferred to any sort of private entity for, for development. And, and that's built within its statutes and, it, and its memorandum of understanding. And, um, and that's where you see the housing co-ops that are being built today um, is um, largely out of this 2018 announcement of the VAHA sites of which the Community Land Trust put um, a proposal in and, and won the bid um, of these for these seven sites, VAHA being Vancouver Affordable Housing Asso Association. And you can see, I don't know if you can see the sites there um, in this slide. What's interesting about this partnership is that this is not 100% cooperative housing. And, and I would say that's where the success of the model has been in, in the last seven or eight years. It has been co-op housing and not-for-profit housing coming together to jointly tackle the affordable crisis and jointly build um, new, new, new affordable housing in, in British Columbia generally. So this is a snapshot of that announcement. It was breaking news at the time because it was the single the single largest land investment by a, by a municipality into non market housing. So out of that um, um, that Vaha, there's the there's the spelling out of the acronym was a thousand homes for almost two thousand residents over seven sites over the city of Vancouver and the value of the land was um, was about one hundred and thirty million dollars. So when we're looking at um, what were the key ingredients, we needed the land, and you can see this investment of land by the city of Vancouver. We needed money. Um, so with respect to money, that would be financing arrangements. We need to look at scale. I did talk a little bit about scale and the, the number of units on each site, and we needed capacity. Um, um, like I said, they were critics of the governance model. The board of directors of a housing co-op are not real estate developers. They may be a real estate developer on board. They may be a lawyer, but um, having the expertise through a staffed organization like the Community Land Trust, like the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC, was the key ingredient to this success. It also in, in, um, created some sort of continuity in future years. A housing co-op board could change in two, in two years. It could be a different group of people at that board. This key ingredient was that the the um, the lease was with the community land trust, which had its own professional staff and would continue to have its professional staff in future years because it was a legal entity. And the fifth um, was partnerships. The co-op housing sector did not do this alone. It partnered with different not for profits. And um, I'll show you some some photos, but literally on one site, there will be a housing co-op and a not-for-profit housing society on the same site. And they're sharing a parking lot, they're sharing a playground. And that really has been the secret sauce um, in that we have so much more in common with our not-for-profit housing partners than we do apart. So what's influencing with the housing affordability was the debt, the housing operation and reserves. And amortization was one thing that that we were able to um, work through with, with CMHC in not a 30 year mortgage, but a 50 year amortization. Once you spread that amortization to 50 years, 
that's when you're able to deepen that level of affordability. So with the community land trust, we're able to do protecting the homes that we already have. I talked about a net growth in housing co-ops. Um, we have some existing homes that that are under that need to be repaired, and we need to protect those in addition to building new homes. And it is about adding a new newly uh, affordable homes and also stewarding assets of the community, the community wealth, the the land that belongs to City of Vancouver. Um, stewarding that as a responsibility that the Community Land Trust is responsible for. Um, so far, um, we've been able to create more than 2,200 new affordable homes and save or uh, protect um, 300. And if you look at 2016, in, in 2016, there were 14,800 14, co-op homes, 300 being within the Land Trust. And by by 2024, we expect that to increase. Um, so there'll be almost 16,600 co-op homes and the community land trust homes just under 2,400. What's interesting with the community land trust homes is that collectively the community land trust is the owner of those homes and now has the um, now has leveraging power as a collective for the the value to for future borrowing, whereas these individual co-ops uh, only have their 56 units or their how many ever units. When they're in the land trust and the land trust is the joint ownership, the on the as the asset, the joint value of those homes is what we can leverage to borrow more money for financing and repairs or retrofits. So that is really um, um, that's really where we talk about scaling up uh, in in the community housing sector. That really is where that comes from, and we're not single, single unit, single entities or single co-ops that are um, that aren't, aren't able to leverage the the collective. So challenges to preservation. This really is about um, the the older homes. Some co-ops are in default. Some are are up um, for possible purchase by private investors. The cost of acquisition or asset management is expensive and access to, to money, like I talked about, of borrowing is, is, is challenging. If, if you have a lease that has not been renewed, you can't really borrow on that because the, 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 the financial agencies or the banks or the credit unions will, will not lend if you have a lease expiring in a couple of years. So these are some of the challenges that are existing with housing co-ops when it comes to access to capital. This is an example of, of two co-ops in Burnaby where um, they are on the, the union, the pension funds, the union pension funds were, were the owner and their leases expired. And it did um, hit in the media because the people living in these homes were predominantly seniors. They had limited income and um, their, their co-op was about to be purchased by a private investor. So it's a really good example of, of our, our responsibility as CHFBC, not only to grow, but also to preserve the units that we already have. Thankfully, um, through the work of, of our CEO and our executive director, Tiffany Dezita from the Community Land Trust, this, this has a good news ending. But I want to show you this slide because um, 425 homes, mostly the seniors. But look at the number of people that came into play for this to happen. The two co-ops had to use their reserves, which they had reserves. CHFBC and the Community Land Trust contributed. Collectively, that was $9.2 million. Then the city of Burnaby, this was unprecedented, um, almost $30 million in a grant. And then the provincial government financed the balance of um, $132.6 million for the BC Housing Hub. So collectively, we were able to buy those both properties for $162.4 million. But, but we couldn't have done it without all these, these parties coming to the table. So it really, it really comes to play that um, the, what's happening now is that multiple people are coming together to make things happen. So let's look a little bit about some of those co-ops I talked about in distress and how we are working at um, at saving those co-ops. So this, this awful picture uh, represents a co-op called Hoy Creek Co-op in Coquitlam. 
And you can see they were in default of their mortgage. Their, their units were uninhabitable. Uh, there was 96 homes there. They were built in 1982 in a really prime real estate in Coquitlam. And uh, with the work of the Community Land Trust and the city of Coquitlam and some creative fi from financing and support and grants, we were able to, um, to purchase Hoy Creek. And you can see at the bottom there what's going to come out of that is um, it's going to look like this. Um, once that building is, 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 is completed with more homes. So not only saving the existing housing co-ops, the homes that were there, but adding more. So the Land Trust right now has uh, a portfolio of just under 3,000 homes. Um, some are still under development and some are under construction as well. And just to put the context into uh, um, the cost, like how much does it cost to live in these homes? I pulled um, some housing charges that exist as of, you know, 2022, 2023 um, of three of these housing co-ops um, within the land trust. And you can see the range, a, a large range, because, you know, it depends on the household income. But you could see the cap being 2,500 for a two bedroom, 3,100 for a three bedroom. Um, and and these are these are the different um, this is a, these are the different co-ops. The North Arm hasn't really come onto market yet. This will be coming onto the market in the coming weeks. This is a housing co-op that is, I think, 58 units, 58 or 56. It's, it's uh, on Fraser and East 17th in Vancouver. And it's 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 for um, people 55 plus. So those housing charges are, are representative of, of that. So those are the three co-ops I talked about. These are what those buildings look like. So this is the one I was talking about here. You could see this is Fraser View Tower. So our, our buildings are being built with community in mind. You've got Tower 1, Tower 2, large density buildings in the middle area for community gardening and community building capacity. But if you look straight ahead, um, those townhouses in the front, that's not a co-op. That is the not-for-profit society that's occupied by Tikva Housing Society. And, um, and they are, um, they are, they are supporting the Jewish community, but this is the same site. This is site five, and um, and again, housing co-ops living on the same site was not for profits and sharing amenities and space. So they they share a playground, they share they share a parkade, they share the community gardens, they share a common room, and so forth. So. Um, why we use a community land trust because um, the community land trust can more easily receive that land transfer and it also has the experience and the staff to either rebuild redevelop or expand and when a co-op is facing a financial challenge um, by coming into the community land trust they can leverage the group asset so that they can borrow and 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 help that co-op in repairing their building this is where we project the growth of co-ops and um, you can see not-for-profits also increasing all the way to 2028. But um, our work is, is not insular. We're not just focusing on our community land trust. Community land trust, we have a community land trust, but a community land trust is a concept. It's, a, it's an entity that can be created. And um, in the news as of last year was that uh, City of Vancouver signing Hogan's Alley um, which is which is the black neighborhood um, near the Georgia Viaduct, um, where they're uh, supporting them in community, community land trust. So we we um, we have been been able to to speak with them about how they could create a community land trust, how they could use the community land trust, and there is a community land trust um, across Canada. There is a network of community land trust that is building. It's not just in British Columbia, and it really has been that vehicle for growth for both nonprofit and, and housing co-ops. So I did want to include some initiatives. Um, and here we uh, talk a little bit about, there's some federal uh, $1.5 billion for co-op fund. There is a $500 million provincial acquisition fund. And of course, the city of Vancouver is, um, has enacted that framework for the co-op leases. So this was in the news um, as of, um, 
July, January, January 12th, the development of a rental protection fund. And really that enables um, the, the fact that as much as we're building um, and acquiring more units for affordable housing, we are losing that much to, to the real estate investments trusts. And um, between 2016 and 2021, we lost um, just over 97,000 homes or that were renting below $1,000. So it's kind of like that carpet being rolled up behind you. You're building and acquiring new affordable housing, but you're losing them just probably at an even faster pace. So this, this fund really was about um, was about addressing that that challenge uh, by the BC government, but putting um, putting that into the hands of of the of the of the community housing sector, which is BC Nonprofit Housing Association, the Co-op Housing Federation of BC, and the Aboriginal Housing Management Association. So that's an initial grant of five hundred million dollars. There will be a contribution agreement. And um, really, we, we would hire staff, industry professionals, and and help um, not for profits to to buy to buy properties that um, to be used for not for profit housing that might otherwise have been lost to to private market. Some other resources are um, this YouTube video talks about a co-op. What what is a co-op? And also on our website, it talks about how to start housing co-op. And um, that's the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't go over. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing now. Thank you so much. That was uh, really, I found very interesting and certainly opened up possibilities for ownership that go way beyond strata. Um, I'm particularly interested in the that Viennese model that you were speaking about. Yeah, I was surprised to learn that um, half of the city of Vienna is actually non non market housing. They are, they have yeah, very progressive um, policies towards that. So there must be a lot to learn from them. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, if you could send that link, that would be great. I will. Yeah, I will send that paper. Up. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but we've got such a small group today that um, I'm hoping some of you will just speak up and... I have a question that relates to uh, the university endowment lands and what, um, it's not part of the city of Vancouver. Are there any particular, um, aspects or the fact that it's uh, it's not within the city or I don't know if it's treated differently and if that would be a factor in, in building some kind of co-op housing on, at the, on the yeah I mean I mean I, I, this is definitely a question for our real estate developers but I do know that um, that the, there is something in the Strata Act that 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 enables that with the with the endowment lands. I think it's something. Um, I, I don't remember which article in the Strata Act, but I will certainly follow up with that uh, for you um, with the endowment lands. And I do believe that there are some in indigenous um, in, in some some First Nations that are that have that opportunity as well. But I do remember the UBC endowment lands being on one of them where um, there is something in the strata act that would that would enable um, would would enable that sort of um, affordable housing community housing um, capacity building but um, let me uh, let me get back to you from Tiffany about which which article that is on that it's not available to anybody and I do I do recall in a discussion that it was it's quite unique to um, to certain um, certain entities in the that, that are listed in the act Okay, hey, Nicola, feel free to unmute yourself and, and um, ask Michelle, yeah. Um, it was very interesting, Michelle. There was so much information on my mind is kind of, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, um, 
It, one of the questions I wanted to ask was about so the mix. I mean, obviously that it was the, was the big advantage to the to the old kind of co-ops where there's that mix of people who can afford to pay more, so they're subsidising the people who can pay less. My yeah. question is under the under the, this new model, who makes that decision about how many um, more expensive units there are compared to the ones that are being subsidised? It would be the board of the housing co-op. So. What would happen is um, there is a, I'm just going to use for a simple arithmetic, $100,000 is what is going to be the cost to operate the building that that's meeting the debt obligations, operating the building, you know, like through the property management and putting aside some reserves. So the housing co-op board will meet and decide um, based on the need of their particular community, how the housing charges are distributed across across the co-op. Our, our responsibility to the community land trust is that they are obligated to to make that payment through their lease, but um, the 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 co-op will know which members are are shelter, for example, like how many do they can they afford that shelter? How many people um, are can afford the the higher amount of their housing charges? Some some units are are just naturally marketed at a higher rate. Uh, just just their physical location because you can you can get closer to market with that um, and and that's really how it's been working quite quite successfully. Um, sometimes people move into a housing co-op and um, their circumstances change, so they would ask their board, um, this you know this this has happened. Can I reduce my housing charges? Those kind of decisions are still being made by the board of directors for the housing co-op. And the board, the board, I'm. I'm kind of confused about how the board of directors is created in the first place because if you haven't already got the people living in the in the apartments then how do you elect a board how does the board oh, okay <laughs> so 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 what happens is we have a founding board which you remember that that vienna graph where it shows we create the housing association first so, so we're creating a housing association and there are there's nobody living there there's no revenue coming right we're only creating that association for the sole purpose of entering into agreements to build to sign a lease um so it is it is a legal entity the board of chfbc has appointed its senior staff to act in a role of what we call the founding board once the um once the the building is fully occupied the founding board turns over the management of the co-op, of the operations of the co-op, the governance of the co-op over to the board. Um, and the, that board is selected at, um, at an annual general meeting. They run for election and the people that live there elect their board. Okay, yeah, it was that, the, the initial time that I was having trouble with saying. So then, so then at the very beginning, when yeah. you apply to come and live in the housing co-op, um, do you have to produce evidence of your income and then they'll decide how much you have to pay? Yes, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, that's, okay. that's, that's the process. Some people, uh, because of their own privacy, don't want to provide that. And if that's the case, then they just pay what we call rent at the door. It's, it's just going to be the top amount. So okay. it's, it's, I'm going to make up a number. It's $1,800. They say, okay, we'll pay $1,800. But then they don't have to do that, that, that revenue, um, it's called uh, annual income verifications. And also um, some of the terms of the lease that we have with the city of Vancouver, depending on the property, will identify certain tar certain targets. So we also have income limits, right? So there are some co-ops where, you know, the average household income cannot exceed $130,000 a year. So for that purpose, we will have to do some income testing. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Michelle, you mentioned the 50-year uh, amortization more than once, and I'm wondering where does that money come from? Like, who's who's ponying up money for 50 years at a at a time? Is it the regular banks or yeah, is well, this CMHC, CMHC will underwrite? Yes, CMHC. So, so it, they provide a kind of insurance, and you would yeah. go through probably like Van City or Van a cooperative. City, yeah. 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 So there's a question um, that I got here, um, the range of sizes of units. Has there been any research on the ideal or the ranges of units for residents? Um, I'm not aware of any research. I'm sure there, 
there probably is. Um, I do know that three bedrooms are in high demand in, in Vancouver. Um, they're 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 rare to <laughs> they're they're so rare it's unbelievable. So um, definitely definitely I, I do know one one development where um, they didn't I don't know what the reason was, but you can be in a situation where if you don't really put some thought and intention into your unit size makeup, you not be able to market it, right? So if you only build one bedrooms and, and there's a need for two, three, or, you know, the rare four bedroom, um, it definitely is um, something that the development team factors into, into their work. <laughs> I'll ask another question if nobody else has one. Um, okay, so no co-ops. I mean, I live in a I live in a co-op, but it's um, a different kind of co-op where you you actually buy your place in the first place, and yeah, then equity. you don't buy you don't buy the unit, you buy shares in the building. Yeah. Um, but the kind of co-ops that you're talking about, um, they you, you the individual person doesn't have any equity in it, right? No. So so you just go in, no no down payment, no nothing, um, but then you just pay your monthly rent. Um, you do have shares, so the co-op will have shares. You there is a share purchase to be okay. registered. Okay. Um, the share purchase does not increase in value. It does not increase with any interest. The share purchase is the share purchase. Okay. So if so you put in twenty five hundred, you take out twenty five hundred, with the exception that if your if your unit is in disrepair, we um, the the co-op can deduct any outstanding costs or or outstanding balances that you have. From that share purchase but there's no uh, increase in that amount right i'm also a member of a camping co-op we own land on hornby island and it's the same thing you bought your share at six hundred dollars that's all you get back that's right that's <laughs> yeah right. it's in yeah. the co-op act even though it's worth huge much more than that now yeah right yeah but the asset stays with the co-op correct yeah, right. that's right that's right, right. yeah mm -hmm. so do new members uh get the same pricing or does it get cheaper for them there what have been there? there have been housing co-ops um that the the share the share purchase has increased over time so if you have moved into a co-op in i don't know 1982 and the share purchase was 1500 dollars, your share purchase they're not going to increase your share purchase years from now but new people but new people coming in the share purchase may increase to 3500 and that's mm -hmm. often related to the debt uh, that the co-op has had to incur the retrofitting, the repairing. Um, so they're coming in at thirty-five hundred dollars. Um, so that has happened. So the share purchase amount doesn't stay the same in 1973 as it does in 2005. Mm -hmm. But yeah. in order to change the share purchase, the membership of the co-op has to agree so that the original members are grandfathered and they have to pass a, a, a special resolution of the membership to change those that share purchase amount. So if the so there's no actual market um, profit to be made either because if the land doesn't it's it's really the land that's going up in value it, yeah. in a forty year old building the building is decreasing in value as the land is increasing in value but the co op doesn't own the land they're leasing the land yeah some co ops right. do own the land some of them are fr freehold there's a there's so, a few of them. But um, a lot of them lease their land. Okay. And they'll have a sixty-year lease. It depends. Different, mm. different, different leases. Yeah. Okay. This is. Um, a, this, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, it's maybe not a question you can answer, actually, Michelle. But um, I, I mean, I first came to Vancouver in the seventies when the co-op thing was huge, right? I mean. I belong to about five different co-ops in different parts of my life, a camping co-op, a babysitting co-op, a laundry co-op even. <laughs> but um, And it was so successful in terms of building um, co-op housing in, the, in those days. What, why do are we, are we not recreating that now? The, um, the, the, the reason, the, first of all, they were, they were sort of developed by government. There was, um, but that that model that those those pieces that come together are not are simply not available now. The pieces, the 
the, the land financing land. arrangements, the um, the anything that it took to build a, a housing co-op in in the seventies or eighties, they are they were they were led by government, depending on the government at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, they were they were they're not they're not available with the with the current the current state. And um, and they also included operating agreements that include that were supporting co-ops financially in terms of operating their building, in terms of providing subsidies that expired 40, 50 years from now. And that kind of arrangement just doesn't exist because it's a financial commitment for right. another 50 years. That no government is prepared to make for governments to come. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So if I could just ask for clarification, so that means there has to be political will. Is that is that? Is that yeah, right? I would I would say for sure that housing is definitely political. Yeah. Um, it helps that we have a national housing strategy, um, and and that we have we have a government today that is that is very supportive of of affordable housing, and this is a this is an unprecedented precedented time for us and we have to take advantage of of what's available um, and the capacity is not a hundred percent reliant on government it's it's creating an environment and creating a platform by which um, government will want to partner with us but we have to take responsibility for ourselves as a sector um, and 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 manage our assets um, and the assets that the government is giving us responsibly. And they need to see that. And that's really been what's happened um, and what we've learned from the first generation. Hmm. All right. Thanks. On that, I'll thank you once again, Michelle. It's been really informative. And um, uh, we're, we're at time and we really appreciate the, the thought and the amount of information you given us. We've got a lot to think about here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye.